Okay, so I'm here this evening with Yuri Budovichenko from Soft Vellum. They sell a product called Nimble Streamer. And what's interesting about Nimble Streamer is that it enables dynamic packaging in a lot of different applications. I'm familiar with how it works with live and also with on demand. Uh, today, Yuri is going to go through those scenarios, but also talk about how it works in a in a DVR setting and also in a uh, distributed setting where you might have nimble streamer at, at remote nodes as opposed to simply at the central server. So it's a presentation that Yuri prepared for us. Um, and let's go through it. And this is the live scenario. Why don't you take us through this, Yuri? OK, uh, hi, everybody. So live streaming is uh, when we talk about the packetizing, uh, the content live streaming is always uh, dynamic. So you get uh, some content from the encoder or from any source you have. Uh, you have the stream in one of the uh, protocols uh, that are popular out there, like RTMP, RTSP, whatever. And so you continuously have a content going into your device, into your uh, media server. So the only thing that a uh, software media server uh, like Nimble Streamer needs to do is take uh, content, uh, split it into chunks, and uh, create a playlist, dynamic playlist, uh, to in order to allow um, other devices to watch it. So uh, there's no other option than dynamic streaming, uh, dynamic packaging for live streaming uh, scenarios. That's, well, you, you that's basically it. You said that, but couldn't is that with your product or is that with any product? Because I know there are some products that can you know create separate Dash and HLS uh, streams and then just point the the different players to to those streams. Is that not, I mean, I know you don't do it, but is it possible to do it that way? Um, well, uh, as far as I, as far as I know about the software media server market, everybody does that. So they have a single uh, source of uh, live uh, content. Oh. They dynamically packetize it uh, into any protocols this media server supports. Like we support HLS and Dash and a number of uh, other real-time protocols like RTSP or RTMP. It doesn't matter what, what's the input, the output would, would be the protocol set uh, that is defined by the user. In our case, it's like HLS and Dash. Both are packetized uh, protocols. Okay, so I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, I think, you know, 10 years ago, we're, we didn't have Dash and HLS 10 years ago, but before dynamic packaging came into being, people would create both protocols with, with hardware encoders. Um, and you're saying exactly. me, you're saying media encoders don't 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 uh, static package, but um, hardware encoders, you know, obviously still do. And that was that was a question I had in my mind. So walk us through, you know, where do I install this? Um, what does it cost to me install it? How many um, viewers can I support with one typical installation of of your software? Uh, okay, so uh, Nimble Stream is basically an application, a native application for uh, the majority of operation systems you might uh, install on your server, which is all flavors of uh, Ubuntu, uh, I mean uh, Linux, which is Ubuntu, CentOS, uh, Debian, uh, we support Windows, uh, we support Mac, uh, we also support some exotic uh, OSs like Raspberry Pi uh, hardware and its uh, OSs. So it basically can be installed anywhere since it's a native application. So whatever new platform uh, our customers ask us about, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, some, some time to import that. So you install the software on any, um, any server, physical or virtual server you may have. Uh, for your task, uh, and that's it. So you make a uh, basic uh, setup uh, via the uh, WMS panel uh, web service or via the config files. And so from that moment, uh, any, uh, any requests that are coming from uh, the viewers to the uh, URL which you define uh, by your setup, um, that's it. They, they can access the live stream. Uh, the number of users uh, basically will depend on the throughput of your uh, network because the packetizing process is very lightweight. It doesn't consume a lot of uh, CPU or RAM, uh, unlike uh, the transcoding, because transcoding is a really demanding process, but transmuxing or repacketizing or packetizing, if you will, it's, uh, it's pretty easy. Uh, so as we always say to our customers who ask about the configuration of the hardware, it depends on your bandwidth. So the more bandwidth you have, uh, the more viewers you can handle, basically. What, what percentage of your users are deploying in the cloud versus in their own premises? 
Uh, I think it's the majority, like uh, <clears throat> 80%, uh, because uh, a lot of people like uh, Azure, a lot of people like AWS, uh, or like DigitalOcean, Rakespace, you name it. Uh, some people that are heavily investing into their infrastructure, they make physical servers, especially this is important in the countries which have uh, don't have uh, the virtual infrastructure yet. Like we have uh, customers from Indonesia with thousands of islands, and uh, basically you won't have AWS instances in those uh, distant areas. So you need to install the physical hardware somewhere uh, closer to your viewers. But the majority of customers use uh, cloud infrastructure, I would say. Okay, and how do you charge? What what is the charge for your product, and how do you charge? Is it a can I buy a license for the entire software? Or is it monthly, or how does that work? Uh, we have a, a combined model. The Nimble Streamer is a freeware, which is basically doesn't uh, need any licenses for the tra for the packaging part. Uh, you may control it uh, via the config files, but if you want to control it via the uh, software as a service, where uh, the web service called WMS Panel, you need to pay uh, a little extra. We, uh, the price starts from uh, uh, thirty dollars per month which is $20 per account itself and $10 per each uh, server installation. So if you have a network of 10 servers, you're going to pay $120 per month, plus some extras for statistics which you may find useful for your uh, network because we have a plenty of stats for all kinds of situations, starting from the viewers, uh, beginning with, uh, like starting from viewers and up to like ASN, geo statistics and things like that. Okay. All right, so this is live streaming. This is the first application. Um, and this is VOD static packaging. And I, I borrowed some images from Microsoft Azure, not <coughs> only because they were, <laughs> they made it easier to explain, but why don't you tell us what's going on here, tell us where your software goes, and, and walk us through what's happening in this slide. All right, uh, the static packaging, uh, uh, first thing is that uh, NimbleStream does not use static packaging, it's, it uses dynamic one, but uh, we have some customers that are coming from static packaging field. Uh, they have static packaging background. And in this regard, it doesn't matter whether you use the Azure the uh, or AWS, it doesn't matter pretty much. Uh, what you do is you pre-package your content, uh, your VOD content into chunks, uh, HLS chunks or um, MPEG dash uh, segments. You create a static playlist and that's it. You just point your viewers to that playlist and it takes chunks from static uh, storage where you uh, locate those files, those chunks. So the, the uh, advantage of this approach is uh, pretty obvious. You can just easily uh, create your VOD uh, content, uh, put your VOD content any place you want without any extra software. Like you have basic Nginx or Apache uh, instance you package your files with uh, some decent packaging tools. It's uh, a lot of them out there. You package it, you put it out there. That's it. That's all you need to do. So the downside of that is that uh, you would need relatively uh, larger uh, storage uh, to handle the, those uh, chunks. Also, there's no flexibility in here. So if you want to create the second server with uh, this content and put it somewhere in the other geographical location, you would need to copy all those files uh, there. Uh, obviously, for small deployments uh, where you're just getting started with your VOD streaming, it's it's fine. It's a good approach. But as soon as you face uh, some flexibility issues, some uh, scaling, uh, uh, some scalability issues, uh, that's where you need to look into some other solutions, which is uh, dynamic packaging. Okay. Um, so that you're you're essentially encoding and packaging, and you've got double the assets for every streaming endpoint. So you're- That's extra. right. If you, yeah, if you have uh, multiple uh, resolutions, you will have uh, extra sets of uh, chunks, uh, chunk lists, uh, chunks and uh, playlists and things like that. Okay, so in this in this scenario here, as you pointed out, there is, you don't you don't need Nimble Streamer anywhere. You're, uh, you're fine no. with just a regular software. Okay. Right. So this is dynamic packaging and VOD dynamic packaging. So walk us through what's happening here. All right, uh, this is the next step, uh, and we, we implemented that in Nimble Streamer. Uh, what it does is uh, you have uh, your MP4 files uh, that are, you know, lying, uh, that are there on some HDD. Yeah, you have installed Nimble Streamer instance, 
and uh, you go to the like WMS panel or you go to config files and say, okay, uh, this is my storage where where I handle my MP4 files. And uh, this is the URL, the output URL, I'd like to have those file, files being accessed uh, through. Um, you save this simple rule in, uh, like in a web interface, and then uh, you, uh, you have this URL created by, uh, like you used those uh, settings you just made. Uh, having that URL, you uh, send it to your viewers, and then what happens is, um, as soon as the first uh, viewer tries to access this playlist, Nimble Streamer understands what, which chunks are being requested, and it goes to a source file, uh, creates chunks uh, that are being requested right now for the time which is being requested right now. Uh, Nimble puts it into the cache, and then from that cache, it's being delivered uh, to any viewer that requests that particular chunk. So if there is like a new new episode of a new show uh, being put out at the uh, at the same time. And a lot of people have view, uh, tries to access it. They will uh, view it from the cache. Uh, they will uh, download all. All of them will download the same chunks that are being uh, packaged on the fly and put in the uh, uh, cache. So what it does is that uh, uh, each chunk is being uh, created just once. It's there in the cache. Uh, by default, it's a file cache, so you can uh, set up the time for time for life of this uh, cache chunk like a day or two or a month, a couple of months, whatever you want. And so uh, as soon as uh, people are requesting those chunks they're getting from cash, uh, no extra resources are needed to actually uh, generate it. Uh, so this, the CPU overhead is, uh, a little, uh, is a little bit of a downside of this approach because you need to generate it on the fly, especially if you're, if you uh, if you have a busy uh, busy website, busy uh, service. However, once it's being uh, created, uh, the CPU is not used uh, basically because all it does, all the Nimble Streamer does, is that it takes all the chunks from cache and delivers it through the network. So, as in case of uh, live streaming, uh, the only uh, bottleneck here is the network, not the CPU, not the RAM. Uh, chunks are already there. You don't need to do anything uh, other than that. Well, I mean, how much? I mean, basically, for each movie, you need for each piece of content, you need two x or three x RAM. So, I mean, you're talking about huge amount of RAMs if you're gonna if you're thinking you can cache all. You know, it's not RAM. Uh, the trick is, it's not RAM. It's uh, by default we use file cache, uh, which means that well, we can change it. Uh, you can uh, tell Nimble Streamer if you have low a low amount of files and huge RAM, rather than HD, you can say, okay, I want to store it in. Uh, you know, in, uh, in RAM, but by default it's file cache. So you have uh, HDD uh, or uh, uh, SSD uh, hard disk, uh, or just simple uh, HDD, and that's it. Uh, your file, uh, your uh, chunks are being stored on file uh, system, and as soon as someone is requesting that, it's just being uh, taken uh, from from the disk. If a lot of people are requesting at the same time, it's uh, it will hang on uh, in RAM for some time, but then it's uh, being raised uh, for new newer chunks. So it doesn't, doesn't make a lot of uh, load on RAM. Doesn't that offset the storage benefit, though? I mean, part of the benefit of dynamic is you're not storing the assets twice, but you're saying you're going to store it twice at least for during periods of high demand, and you can control that with time to life. But that does kind of offset the benefit of. Um, you know, I, I, what you're doing is you're balancing CPU versus versus storage at that point, I guess. Uh, yeah, right. So the the trick here is that, uh, well, uh, for example, uh, if you uh, if you own a library of uh, like a thousand uh, thousand of episodes of uh, several shows, chances are that not all thousand uh, episodes will be watched at the same time uh, by all the people. And they're not being watched uh, through through the long period of time. All of, uh, all of those files will not be watched. So um, if there's some old show, it will not be requested uh, for a long time. It will not be uh, stored in uh, file cache. So you're good at that. Uh, good with that. Uh, uh, so it combines the uh, the static uh, packaging approach with uh, CPU dynamic packaging, uh, making it a, a little bit more uh, optimized in compared to. Mm, the dynamic packaging. Okay, 
I think I got it. And let me, um, I, I did a bad job at this. Um, let me go back if I can do that in. Uh, let me try this. Oop, that didn't do it. Um, so live streaming here, um, are, are you doing transcoding and packaging? Typically, or are you so? So I start with a single file. Are you doing the, or, or am I sending you multiple files? Because in this scenario, um, I'm encoding to multiple MP4s and uploading those. Here, are you doing transcoding and packetizing? Uh, the transcoding is a separate process. As I said, uh, packetizing is a really uh, cheap uh, operation in terms of CPU and, uh, and RAM. The transcoding, as you as you know, uh, is a heavy operation. So it's a it's a separate module for Nimble Streamer. So if you need to uh, transcode the stream into several uh, renditions or put some filters on it, uh, that's uh, so you need to install a Nimble uh, uh, Nimble transcoder, which is a premium add-on for Nimble Streamer. Uh, set it up uh, via the web interface to create several uh, several uh, renditions. And then for the, for each of those renditions, you have uh, the the common uh, the common setting for the output. That's it. Okay. And then once once you have those multiple renditions, that's when the dynamic packeting starts to take place. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Good. I just wanted to clarify that because I should have done it while we were uh, on the yeah. subject. Okay. So now looking at VOD remote HTTP origin, what are we doing here? <clears throat> okay, so this is uh, this is the most uh, like uh, beautiful part of this uh, <laughs> of this technology uh, from my point of view. Yeah. So uh, originally, all the files are being like tra traditionally, all files are being put on uh, some file storage. Uh, we uh, we did a step forward and uh, used this uh, HTTP origin approach, uh, remote HTTP uh, origin approach. Uh, say you have uh, AWS storage uh, accessible via uh, HTTP or HTTPS. You put all your MP4 files there, and then you have this. Uh, you have a lot of viewers from geographically uh, distributed uh, areas, like in my example with Indonesia or Russia, biggest country in the world, or Africa, with a lot of countries in there. So uh, you put one. Uh, for example, you have a you have one episode of a show. Say it's just one file. It's being put on uh, HTTP uh, origin in somewhere in, in AWS. You put uh, several edge servers in the locations near your viewers, and on each of the uh, edges, you say, you say uh, to Nimble Streamer, "Okay, your uh, source of, of uh, VOD streaming is not on HDD; it's on HTTP. Here it is." The setting is the same as in uh, as in static. Uh, I mean, as in uh, previous examples. With HDD, but you just point to HTTP uh, storage. So uh, the rest is the same uh, as in the previous example with uh, HDD files. <clears throat> so the first viewer uh, tries to access this uh, file, this chunk of uh, the show. Nimble Streaming knows that uh, this chunk is for the file which is being located somewhere in distant locations on HTTP uh, origin storage. It accesses uh, the, H uh, the file via HTTP, and it takes only the that chunk of the file which is being accessed right now. So if you have a like five gigabytes uh, file, uh, but you need something from the middle, it'll download a couple megabytes from the middle, transform it into chunks, uh, put it into cache, and then deliver it to the viewers that are actually uh, requesting that. Uh, what it, uh, so the benefits uh, of this uh, approach are, are obvious. You save a lot of space on the edges. <clears throat> Basically, your edge might be any low price uh, server you may uh, you may think about. And uh, so, so the, the the download count down, download count is uh, is not is just it's just nothing. Uh, you download only those files you actually need, and not just files, but the uh, pieces of files that you actually need, which saves a lot of bandwidth, uh, a lot of storage, and uh, benefits uh, the one who is creating this infrastructure. Uh, the downside is uh, some CPU consumption uh, during the packaging, uh, but as I said, it's just done once for every chunk. Uh, it's being stored on file uh, file cache on the edge server, and that file uh, cache may also be uh, like tuned, fine tuned. So that's that's the basic approach. 
What about latency? Uh, the latency yeah this is the this is the second downside I would say um, you need to uh, you need to make sure the late, uh, the network is good but um, say you have a, a remote location and you have some file lying out there and your ping is like 300 milliseconds or 500 milliseconds so uh, what happens in this case is that uh, the first guy who is requesting the chunk, is going to wait for that half a second until uh, that chunk is being delivered from the remote location and actually uh, packaged uh, into HLS or MPEG-DAS chunk. So that's only for the first uh, guy who is, who is actually watching this uh, segment. The second one who is going to watch the same file or the same, uh, like the same show, the same piece of the show, uh, there will be no latency at all because the chunk is already there in uh, file cache. Yeah, I mean, that, that assumes, you know, again, we're trading off CPU for storage. So, exactly. if, I've, so if I've got a thousand episodes, you know, not all thousand are going to be in cache. So there's going to be, there's going to be a lot of first guys in your scenario. But either way, I mean, it, you make that decision. Either you, either you increase your latency or you increase your CPU or you increase your storage. But it's nice to have the flexibility to kind of uh, fine tune your, your, your infrastructure that way. Yeah. Okay, I got it. And then the last one, or here, here's the uh, the pros and cons: better storage, or lower storage <coughs> operating expense, uh, better flexibility, and improved responsiveness to remote to remote clients. And then the uh, the negative is uh, increased opex for the CPU. And then this is the one I need some explanation on as well because I wasn't familiar with this one. This is DVR, so you've got live plus VOD. So how are we doing dynamic packaging here? Uh, okay, so uh, if you're doing live uh, streaming, you may want to uh, set up the DVR, which is basically the digital video recording or just recording and playback of the digital media. Uh, I'm sure a lot of our viewers are familiar with that. So yes. the traditional DVR approach is that uh, whatever comes into your uh, live transmoxer is being stored into, uh, uh, like you have uh, package chunks. Uh, of data like a, a, a FMP4 files, FMP4 chunks or MPEG-TS chunks. Uh, they're being recorded in the file system uh, as is. Like uh, you've packaged the live stream, uh, and all the chunks are being placed into your file system. That's it. So later when someone is requesting this chunk uh, from the DVR, it gets what he requests uh, one, uh, one, one by one. Uh, it's fine when you have uh, like a couple streams are being recorded uh, for for a few hours a day. Uh, even if you have a few streams recording uh, on a daily basis, twenty four seven, it's still fine. But when we're talking about uh, like five to six renditions for each stream being recorded for like thirty days, and you have like thousand cameras or thousand streams are being recording this way you end up with a big trouble because there are billions of files you need to store in your storage, uh, you need to handle them, you need to maintain, you need to back up. So uh, it's just big. Uh, it's a huge number. It's really hard to maintain this uh, kind of storage. So what we ended up with is uh, the, com uh, the combined approach. Uh, when live stream goes in, uh, it's being uh, it's being packetized into chunks and delivered to the viewers, uh, but the DVR is recording them into big chunks, not like uh, six-second chunks or three-second chunks as, as we uh, as we all uh, like in HLS or Dash, but uh, like ten-minute chunks, big files uh, recorded as uh, fragmented MP4. So uh, if you have uh, like our uh, stream, hour-long stream, you're going to have like six chunks, six big chunks stored in the file system and it stays for there each, for each uh, for each rung in the ladder right uh, right right so uh, if you have thousands of streams this will reduce the number of uh, files just dramatically on the playback side uh, it works the same way as it works for dynamic packaging for VOD so when the first uh, when someone is requesting a piece of uh, recorded stream uh, it requests some time frame. So nimble streaming goes to uh, to the archive, takes the exact uh, piece of the recorded uh, content, packetizes it on the fly, 
uh, put it on the cache, put it in the cache uh, as always, and then delivers it to the viewer. So we still have this big file lying in the file system, uh, easy to maintain, and then we have a few chunks being stored in um, in the cache, file cache or memory cache, or whatever you like. So what it brings us is that, um, for example, you have uh, uh, like hundreds of civilian uh, surveillance cameras. Okay, and you don't you don't review your streams often. Uh, it's like you need uh, something happened uh, during the night. You wanna uh, you know go back in time and see what's what was, ha what was happening. And so you, we generate previews in our DVR. We uh, allow generating previews uh, view images. So you browse browse through the images, uh, the JPEG files. You browse the JPEG files uh, and see uh, what would you like to see. And then once you know the time uh, time slot, you just go directly there, view it and you know make some actions so once in a while you will have those chunks being uh, dynamically packetized on the fly uh, delivered and viewed and that's it they're going to be lost in uh, cache within like a day depending on your settings so uh, we have the flex the flexibility with maintenance as a pro uh, as a cons we have uh, a little cpu overhead uh, during the first access of the uh, of each uh, individual chunk uh, which is not a big deal because it, uh, it it's being made uh, within like a split of a second. Yeah, so it's a dynamic approach uh, which allows saving a lot of space, uh, not space, saving a lot of time on maintenance. And uh, yeah, that's what we need. That's what uh, a lot of people need uh, these days. Okay, so are our companies traditional static DVR? Are they recording and saving both Dash and HLS formats? Or are they storing an MP4 in, in the small chunks? And then I, I guess you don't know, but I guess there are some people doing that statically. Is that accurate? Uh, that is correct. Uh, uh, some uh, media servers, uh, some of the solutions on the market are saving those chunk files. Uh, it depends on uh, like, uh, what server this is, uh, it may it may save in uh, fragmented MP4 from the beginning. So once you access uh, like MPEG dash, you already have all your segments in place. It's FMP4, it's just being delivered uh, right away. Uh, we used to save uh, uh, like a couple of years ago before we introduced this feature. We used to save it into MPEG TS chunks, uh, uh, which is optimized for old HLS. So uh, it depends on the, on the media server or uh, recording software you use. OK. So moving on to other topics, um, what are you seeing respecting HLS and shared, shared distribution of um, HEVC and H.264? Uh, uh, we have a couple dozen customers who use HEVC in live streams already. Uh, they use uh, hardware encoding for that, uh, uh, preferably. Uh, they're beginning to use that in, uh, in their live scenarios. Um, not much, uh, we don't have much uh, feedback from them as of now. I just know that they're using it. We have some uh, requests in our support system uh, that mention the, the usage of HVC, but the vast majority of users still use H264. Uh, for the live delivery, they use they start using uh, MPEG dash, uh, but the majority, like 70 plus percent, uh, use uh, HLS for that. We have a, a quarterly report called the State of Streaming Protocols, where we share the information about our customer base, uh, not customer base, but the usage of protocols by our customer base, and it still says like 70 plus percent uh, is HLS. So I've I've not seen that. You should you should send that to me. Yeah, sure, sure. What do you, um, regarding transcoding, I'm about to jump into um, an analysis of some of the hardware transcoders like Intel and, mm -hmm. and, um, and NVIDIA. What do you, what's your experience with those and what have you seen in terms of performance and quality? We had, uh, we had that, uh, this benchmarking session with NVIDIA uh, hardware uh, encoders. Uh, the professional encoders, not uh, the one that are used in the gaming uh, devices, or, uh, gaming PCs. Uh, we had tremendous results. Uh, we had uh, a couple of articles about this, uh, showing what settings we used, what renditions we used. Uh, we liked it a lot, uh, especially we liked the fact that uh, we can install 
um, we can use NVIDIA cards on any, basically any uh, operating system that is supported by those, uh, by the drivers, uh, which is Ubuntu, CentOS, um, Windows. Uh, we have no problem with installing their, uh, installing the software, uh, using the software with uh, NVIDIA cards uh, on any of those uh, operating systems. Uh, as for um, QuickSync, Intel QuickSync, we didn't have much uh, experience with that because people prefer using the graphical cards uh, for, for those purposes. So if they, if they decide to use hardware, they, they prefer using uh, hardware encoders like NVIDIA. Um, as far as I know uh, from, uh, from feedback, uh, people don't much use uh, uh, the Intel, the quick, uh, the Intel QuickSync, also because of the uh, requirements for the operating systems, because it takes quite some time to properly set up uh, drivers, uh, set up the operating system, and things like that. I cannot install uh, QuickSync on Ubuntu, for example, which is a big deal for a lot of people. So we got, we we have a lot of uh, feedback from uh, about the Nvidia. And uh, we know that it's working fine. Uh, we uh, did several optimizations for NVIDIA, which allowed uh, people to use more extensively, uh, to use those uh, hardware, that hardware more extensively. So that's that's our experience. OK, and those articles are up on your website? Uh, yep, I'm going to send to you. Yeah. OK, perfect.